Welcome to the U.S. Army Center Military History at Port McNair. We are the uh, hosts uh, for Dr. Eppenheim's today. The OSD History Office has provided the logistics and support and uh, has uh, welcomed the speaker as well. Uh, I just want to say a few words and we'll, we'll let uh, Dr. Eppenheim uh, say, take the stage. I don't want to take too much time from his presentation. Professor Dr. Eppenheim is the Director of Research at the German uh, Military Forces, uh, Military History and Social Sciences Center in Potsdam, right outside Berlin. He uh, studied at the University of Munster and received his doctorate on the Wilhelmine Fleet upgrade from 1908 to 1914. He also teaches modern history as well as military history at both Potsdam and Hamburg University. And is also a commander of the German Navy, Naval Reserve, and teaches military history at the German Navy School as well. His main interests are naval history research and the history of the German armed forces and foreign missions. Currently, he is working on addition of the private papers of the German military intelligence during World War I. Uh, Colonel Nikolai, the chief of the German military intelligence, as well as an addition of uh, important documents from the Anglo German naval raids from 1900 to 1914, uh, together with the British Naval Records Society. Uh, some of his works are Prussia, Rise and Fall of a Great Power, uh, History of Germany from 1648 to 2008, and a biography of Grand Admiral Alfred von Tirpitz. So I don't want to take too much from his time, and your time as well is valuable, so without further ado, uh, Professor Dr. Eppenhans. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll speak from here so that I can see the slides. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for your kind words as well as for your invitation to give a paper here on this uh, important event, um, uh, not only for us in Europe but also uh, for people outside Europe, including the United States, which uh, entered the war in 1917, and also um, many things for your interest uh, here in uh, listening to my paper. If you look at this slide, you can see those, uh, the most important decision makers in Germany on the military side. Uh, you can't see the Chancellor, who could never be seen with the military. Uh, you have on the left the German Emperor, Willem II. Uh, in the center, you have uh, Grand Admiral Tirpitz, the man with the garbled beard. And on the right hand side, you have the Chief of the General Staff, uh, Moltke the Younger. And uh, almost 100 years ago, the last week, if you could move on the slide. Next slide, please. Oh, okay. okay, almost 100 years ago, um, the last week of this month was a week of increasing tension in Europe. Now it seemed that the assassination of the Austro-Hungarian heir to the throne, um, you can see people here, sleepwalkers. Uh, Francis Ferdinand and of his wife at the Bosnian capital Sarajevo on 28th June seemed to end in, an, in a great conflagration. For many people this seemed a somewhat strange turning of events. Many had regarded the murder of Francis Ferdinand as a horrible criminal act, but since nothing had followed from this, they had enjoyed their holidays. If they could afford them in the mountains, the countryside or at the seaside. And even if they could not go afford going on holiday, they had at least enjoyed themselves in the beer gardens. Many politicians had done the same unless they had been occupied by serious matters like the crisis in Ulster, strikes in Moscow and St. Petersburg, or the forthcoming murder trial of the wife of a former French Prime Minister. Without realizing this, they had, however, been living in the eye of a storm which soon was to break out and change both their own lives as well as the political landscape in Europe and further apart. If I might have the next slide. And these events have also uh, had, had a great impact upon families. And this is my grandfather. I just want to show you this. He was a young miner uh, in the rural area who was drafted at the age of 20 and who fought in the battles of the First World War right from the beginning uh, in uh, October 1914 until the very end in November when he was taken prisoner uh, by the British Army. And just to make sheer, uh, clear to you what Im impact this had is eight members of my family had to fight in the war. Four of my grand uh, uncles didn't come back. Uh, two were severely wounded. Uh, he was also severely wounded but had to go back to the front and uh, only one of them came back unharmed. And if you may have the next slide, 
If you look at the battles that he took part in, you can see right from the battles in Flanders in October 1918 to the first German gas attack at Ypres in 1915 to the battles uh, at Verdun or in Romania. Uh, there is a long list uh, of battles he took, took part in and this of course had uh, framed the mindsets of many people in Germany afterwards. And uh, I can still remember him uh, talk about these things, uh, which, of course, uh, he, he, he never forgot. I have the next slide. This is the assassination of, there is no photograph. Uh, we only have these, uh, this kind of uh, commemoration of this assassination of Francis Ferdinand on the 28th of June. The question why this crime, however horrible it had been, had such disastrous consequences, has been a matter of debate ever since. From the July crisis onwards, politicians and historians in every country involved tried to put the blame on their adversaries, arguing that they had only wanted to defend their respective countries. In 1919, in the Treaty of Versailles, the Allies, or the victors, as one might better say, without further examining the origins of the war, simply decreed that Germany was the only culprit to blame. Accordingly, Germany had to pay for whatever damage its armies had caused. Scholarly debate, we have seen uh, the sleepwalkers, has developed in different way, especially since the late 1950s. However, since the so-called Fischer debate, uh, historians, German historians, his historians had unanimously agreed uh, that Germany was probably to a very great degree the nation which had to be held responsible for the seminal catastrophe of the 20th century, as US diplomat and historian George F. Cannon had called it. Fifty years after the Fischer debate and a hundred years after the outbreak of war, a new interpretation of events has been offered by the Australian historian teaching in Britain, Christopher Clarke. In his book, The Sleepwalkers, How Europe Went to War in 1914, he argues, quote, The outbreak of war in 1914 is not an Agatha Christie drama, at the end of which we will discover the, the culprit standing over a corpse in the conservatory with a smoking pistol. There is no smoking gun in this story, or rather, there is one in the hands of every major character. Viewed in this light, the outbreak of war was a tragedy, not a crime. Acknowledging this, he continues, does not mean that we should minimize the belligerence and imperialist paranoia of the Austrian and German policymakers that rightly absorbed the attention of Fritz Fischer and his, and, uh, in historical uh, allies. But the Germans were not the only imperialists are not the only ones to succumb to paranoia. The crisis that brought war in 1914 was the fruit of a shared political culture. But it was also multipolar and genuinely in interactive. That is what makes it the most complex event of modern times, and that it, it is why the debate over the origins of the First World War continues one century after Gavrilo Princip fired those two fatal shots on French Joseph Street. And he continues, in this sense, the protagonists of 1914 were sleepwalkers, watchful but unseeing, haunted by dreams, yet blind to the reality of the horror they were about to bring into the world." Unquote. Thus sharing the blame among all powers involved, it is hardly astonishing that Christopher Clark has uh, sold more than 250,000 copies of his book in Germany within less than six months. Uh, that he has been invited to give talks to innumerable people all over Germany and dozens of talk shows in which many people followed his reflections upon the outbreak of war with shining eyes. However, does this success mean that Christopher Clark's interpretation of the events which finally led to war and which somewhat resembles Lloyd George's dictum from the late 1920s that all nations somehow simply slithered into the war and that, accordingly, there was not only one culprit to blame is suddenly correct. In order to answer this question, I will try to e examine both the more general developments in European history, which contributed to a climate of uncertainty, rivalries and mutual mistrust, as well as the particular circumstances which were eventually responsible for the outbreak of war a hundred years ago. Moreover, I will also look at the beginning of the war as well as uh, its impact upon European and to some extent also global history. May I have the next slide? Looking at the turn of the last century, one can easily identify several developments which had a great impact upon, the European, upon both European and world politics. First, imperialism and co colonialism. You can see here the colonial empires um, in 1914, 
Well, the German one was the smallest one, the British, the, of course, the largest. But all the others had, um, of course, their colony. We have traditional power politics. We have capitalism as one development. We have political mobilization and domestic politics. We have nationalism as an important aspect and a culture of pessimism and social Darwinism. Let's turn to imperialism and colonialism. Whereas in the 18th and early 19th centuries only Britain, France, Spain, Portugal and the Netherlands had been imperialist powers with possessions all over the world, all European powers, whether they were great or small, began to embark upon a policy of expansion overseas. By pegging out claims, as Lord Rosebery uh, had, uh, phrased it, in Africa and Asia, great powers like Britain, France and eventually even Germany, as well as small countries like Belgium and Italy, mm. Uh, they tried to acquire as much territory overseas as possible. Within less than 20 years, all the white spots in the world became part of a mother country across the oceans. Imperialism, of, this is my second point, of course, was closely intertwined with power politics. Only a country with huge possessions overseas seemed a real great power in the second half of the 19th and the first decades of the 20th centuries. The more square miles and inhabitants a country had overseas, the more powerful it seemed in peacetime as well as in the event of conflict, fun conflicts which were thought inevitable. Third, although the idea that the greed for profit was the decisive factor in the scramble for Africa, and may I have the next slide? Well, here you have a German colony in Africa, and um, may I have the next slide one? This is the Baghdad Railway. This is, the, of course, one of the German, leading German bankers, Werner von Siemens, uh, the Deutsche Bank. Well, he was head of the Deutsche Bank, and they were, of course, for financial reasons, interested in this area and building this railway. Although the idea that the greed for profit was the decisive factor in the scramble for Africa and Asia uh, did, of course, uh, also play an important role in an era in which formerly agrarian countries developed into highly modern industrialized nations, in which their populations increased remarkably in within, sh within short periods of time, and in which people moved into rapidly growing urban centers instead of living a modest life in the countryside, the safe and cheap supply of raw materials and food, as well as markets for the export of manufactured goods to keep the economy running and thus preserve social peace. Many statesmen regarded expansion necessary also for this reason. Fourth, without no nationalism, may I have the next slide? This is an interesting, I hope you get interesting um, item. This is uh, the 100 mark German banknote, and if you look at it closely, uh, you can see all the things which seemed necessary for propaganda reasons, but also this also gives you an idea of the self uh, image of the Germans. You have the battle fleet, then of course you have the, the armed Germania, uh, you have of course the industry uh, in here, you have all these items, so this was really a symbol of German nationalism, of national pride. Without the, right, the rise of nationalism, this great game over colonies and markets is also unthinkable. Being proud of their own achievements as a nation and not as individuals, many contemporaries were deeply convinced that these achievements had to be rewarded. Talking about the rise of nationalism, however, also means to mention at least its interrelationship with political mobilization and domestic politics. At the time when more and more citizens in Europe demanded and were granted political suffrages, mobilizing nationalist feelings seemed a means of diverting attention from other problems and of rallying the nation behind its leaders. Fifth, nationalism, and this leads us to, important, to another important factor which influenced the mindsets of those responsible for policy making a hundred years ago, was in turn closely interconnected with social Darwinist ideas. A greater Britain, a greater France and a greater Germany seemed guarantees that these nations would not belong to the dying nations of which Lord Salisbury, British Prime Minister, had spoken in the 1890s, but to the living nations which would still exist, be powerful and thrive in the 20th century. And six, this social Darwinist interpretation of developments was in turn interrelated with deep-rooted cultural pessimism in many intellectual circles. They believed that industrial capitalism and the bourgeois age were bound to collapse under the weight of their inner contradictions. In their eyes, European civilization as a whole was rotten and, lead and heading towards the rocks. Though these intellectuals were by no means able to prepare for or even unleash a great war, they contributed to a mood 
which let war seem as a purge from the deficiencies and unwelcome developments of the modern world, as Thomas Mann, a famous uh, German novelist, called it when war actually had broken out. None of these developments alone, however, uh, would inevitably have led to the Great War. However, taken all together, these developments helped frame a mindset which directly or indirectly deeply influenced the thinking and the decision-making of those responsible for politics at the turn of the last century. Let me come to my next point. May I have the next slide? Ah, this is the German Empire. So taking these developments as the background of what was happening around the turn of the century, what was the most disturbing factor which eventually derailed the course of European politics? Unfortunately, I say, it was the German Empire. In many ways, this empire was a latecomer. After the collapse of the Holy German Empire in, 19, in 1806 due to French pressure, and the establishment of only a loose confederation of 42 states in 1815, a modern nation-state was only founded in 1871 as a result of the so-called Wars of Unification. May I have the next slide? Uh, please remember this, this slide, because here you have uh, the, f the founding of the German Empire in the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles. Uh, we will have a similar picture later on. And here you can see the German Emperor and his military entourage and, of course, the German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck. Benjamin Disraeli, the leader of the British Conservative Party at the time, described the apprehensions this change in the equilibrium of powers entailed as, quote, a revolution whose impact was much greater than that caused by the French Revolution in the 1790s, unquote. Being aware of the inherent dangers of this position, just um, on. Germany's Iron Chancellor, Otto von Bismarck, had, however, steered a careful course between the European great powers. Thus, Bismarck hoped to preserve peace, which he regarded as essential, as essential uh, for the existence of the German Empire and for preventing the, inf the formation of a hostile coalition. Moreover, Bismarck fully accepted that Germany's security and welfare in the future depended upon renouncing any attempts at disturbing the fragile European balance of powers by, direct, by directly or indirectly enlarging its spheres of influence in Europe. In his nightmares, Bismarck was haunted by the idea that the lack of self-restraint as well as of the confidence of the other powers of the continent of Europe might end up in self-destruction. Bismarck's successors, however, did not share the latter's deep-rooted conviction that a moderate course in foreign affairs was a prerequisite for the status of the empire among the European powers. Rather, the accession of the young emperor Willem II to the throne in 1888 marked the end of a long era of self-restraint and land power thinking. May I have another slide? Yeah, this is quite interesting. This is from the 1890s. This is a caricature from the punch. And here you can already see uh, the German emperor uh, called the Enfant Terrible, uh, who might sink the, 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 uh, the European boat. Mm. Uh, all, pow all powers are sitting in, and uh, this was uh, the image all the other powers had of the German Empire, and of course its emperor. It would be too simple, though, to explain this change as the result of the influence of the new and somewhat erratic German emperor. In many ways, Willem II was only the embodiment of a change that had slowly taken place in Germany. If we look at German politics, it is striking to see that an increasing number of politicians as well as parts of the populace regarded Bismarck's dogma of self-restraint as outdated and politically misleading. Why, his critics ask, uh, should Germany continue to protect Austria-Hungary against Russia and Russia against Austria-Hungary? Why should Germany alone among the great powers be denied the right to an independent policy founded upon its own interest? Why high-ranking members of the Emperor's military entourage, foreign officials and parts of the public even asked, shouldn't the Reich even risk a preventive war against Russia or France, or perhaps even both of them to become the hegemonic power on the continent, and thus solving the dilemma of its geographic uh, position in the center of Europe? In the eyes of the anti-Bismarck front, the, policy, the foreign policy of the Iron Chancellor seemed static, unable to adapt to the fundamental changes that were taking place at the same time. As a result, Germany was about to lose the advantages of its political, economic and military strengths. 
Moreover, following Bismarck's convictions of Germany's role both in Europe as well in the world might eventually even mean the beginning of a decline instead of a further increase of power and political influence, progress and wealth, and not to forget of political stability at home. If we look at the, the facts, the demise from the policy of the aging Iron Chancellor seemed compelling, though at first sight only. And the demise, you can see, may I have the next slide? The demise is here, you know, this is from, a, by the way, it's a, a book for, for pupils at um, undergraduate schools. Uh, it's, it's, it's saying this is the German Navy. You can see the big battleship in the back, of the, the Germ the, you have the, the globe, and then you have the, the German war flag. First, the world had indeed begun to change. The whole international system was in a state of flux. In the 1870s and 1880s, as a result of Bismarck's diplomacy, which had somehow integrated all other European powers into a system of overlapping defensive alliances to Germany's advantage, France had been isolated. Developments in the Balkans, however, had helped to slowly drive a wedge between the empire and its most important allies, Russia and Austria-Hungary. Against this background, the decision of Bismarck's successors, former General Caprivi, not to renew the so-called reinsurance treaty with Germany and Russia in 1890, seemed logical, for it eventually somehow seemed to make things easier. Second, whereas Bismarck had at least tried to find new allies, his successors preferred not to tie their hands. They felt confident that on the one hand Germany was strong enough to deter any enemy and to withstand any coalition. On the other hand, in the eyes of the most important decision makers, the disadvantages of entering a new alliance, either with Britain or with Russia, outweighed the advantages of a policy of independence and military self-reliance. An alliance with Britain would have meant to renounce further colonial expansion, and in lines with Russia would have meant drawing Germany into the political mess in the Balkans and alienating its most reliable ally, the dual monarchy. But last not, but not least, continuing rivalries between France and Britain as well as Britain and Russia seemed to allow Germany to play the role of a tertium gaudens laughing third, who in the case of a great struggle between the other great powers would opt for that power or coalition of powers which was willing to make the best offer in return for German support. Eventually, such a development would have helped Germany to revolutionize, and this is important, the international system and to replace Great Britain as the leading world and sea power. This change in German foreign, foreign policy, with its ensuing deep impact upon the international system, coincided with far-reaching changes in other areas. Germany's population ranked second behind Russia. It had risen from 41 million in 1871 to 57 in 1900, thus by far exceeding that of Britain which had only 41 million and France with only 39 million at the same time. Similarly, the latecomer, Germany, had overtaken its neighbors in most important fields of industrial production. Whereas Germany's production of cast iron and steel, I have the next slide, you can see it here, you can see the comparisons. Um, had amounted to only one-third of, of the British in 1870, Germany had outclassed Britain in this respect in 1900. The German chemical, electrical and optical industries were the best in the world, and though Germany was only a constitutional, no parliamentary monarchy, the social insur insurance system introduced by Bismarck in the late 1880s was unique. German scientists and researchers, German artists and novelists were famous for their works within and outside the country. Against this background, it was only naturally that Germany, after a period uh, of zigzagging, embarked upon a course commonly called Weltpolitik. We have seen this school book, and I have the next slide. Well, this is the embodiment of Weltpolitik. This is, uh, of course, uh, Admiral von Tirpitz. As Max Weber, a famous sociologist, put it in his inaugural speech at the University of Freiburg in 1895, the foundation of the Reich would have been a foolish prank unless it had not been the beginning of an era of further expansion. In a long memorandum to his political masters in Vienna, the Austrian ambassador in Berlin described this change in German foreign policy on the eve of the introduction of a new naval law into the Reichstag in early 1900. Quote, the leading German statesmen and above all Kaiser Wilhelm have looked into the distant future and are striving to make Germany's already swiftly growing position as a world power into a dominating one, 
reckoning hereby upon becoming the genial successor to England in this respect. People in Berlin are however well aware that Germany would not be in the position today or for a long time to assume this succession and for this reason a speedy collapse of English world power is not desired since it is fully recognized that Germany's far-reaching plans are at present only castles in the air. Notwithstanding this, Germany is already preparing with speed and vigor for a self-appointed future mission. In this connection, I may permit myself to refer to the constant concern for the growth of the German naval forces. England is now regarded as the most dangerous enemy, which at least, as long as Germany is not sufficiently armed at sea, must be treated with consider consideration in war always. But because of the universally dominant Anglophobia, it is not easy to convince public opinion of this unquote. The powerful navy was supposed to be both the symbol of this change as well as the most important instrument to implement this policy either in a Cold War or in a hot war with Great Britain. Of course, the young Kaiser was a naval enthusiast who could hardly await imitating the example of his British relatives. However, in a globalizing world, only a powerful navy seemed able to defend Germany's global interests and to secure the so-called place in the sun. Moreover, sea power or, as Tirpitz, the main architect of Germany's navy, naval build-up, was allegedly uh, called it a prerequisite for the protection of the German colonies as well as of economic wealth, industrial progress and commerce. Without a strong navy, Tirpitz kept on arguing and many pe people believed him, Germany would be unable to preserve its steadily rising sea interests and subsequently inevitably decline to the status of a pre-industrial, and this is Tirpitz's quote, poor farming country. Finally, sea power also had important domestic political implications. The government hoped that the acquisition of sea power and the envisaged great success of world policy through the plan carefully designed by Tirpitz would safeguard the overall expansion of German industry, foreign trade, colonies and the navy, and what is more important, thus offer a permanent solution to the so-called social problem which threatened the existing political and social order. In many respects, the concept Tirpitz developed in the mid-1890s was congruent with the ideas of the prophet of a new navalism, the US naval officer Alfred T. Mahan, uh, from his study of Britain's rise to world power since the Dutch wars in the 1600s. Mahan had deduced the overall importance of sea power for the rise and fall of states. Like Mahan, Tirpitz was convinced that only a battle fleet could defeat the enemy's fleet in order to gain command of the sea and thus attain naval supremacy. Accordingly, this fleet was supposed to consist of 41 battleships, 20 large cruisers, 40 small cruisers, 144 torpedo boats and 72 submarines within 20 years' time. This attempt at revolutionizing the international system of powers in Germany in Germany's favor by building up a powerful uh, navy soon proved the beginning of the end. Difficult as such a course designed by the Kaiser, Bülow, the Chancellor and Tirpitz, the naval secretary was in itself anyway, due to unforeseeable changes in international politics it did not consider adequately the enormous costs of the build-up of the navy required because, uh, the, because that the enormous cost of the build-up of the Navy required public agitation as well as visible success in order to gain support of Parliament. Subsequently, German foreign policy oscillated between the policy of a free hand, attempts at forming new alliances and political demonstrations like the Kaiser's landing in Tangiers in 1905 or the Panzer Leap in, in 1911 intended to make clear that Germany still was an, an important player in the great game for the distribution of the world. These offenses and often aggressive interventions in, in international politics increasingly aroused mistrust among the other powers. These developments became more and more problematic because on the one hand they coincided with an open naval race. I have the next slide. Here you can see this is the caricature from a social democratic mag magazine anyway, but here you can see uh, King Edward VII and the German Emperor, uh, of course, uh, racing with I sit sitting in battleships um, in a race which eventually could only lead uh, to a catastrophe. From 1906 uh, onwards, both countries built an incredible amount of warships, public outcries and naval scares further increased tensions between both countries. More importantly, this Anglo-German arms race coincided with far-reaching changes of the international situation. For various reasons, Britain had begun to settle its differences with many of its rivals or potential enemies from the Far East to the European continent. 
1905, Britain and France formed the Entente Cordiale. The defeat of Russia against Japan in 1905 facilitated a rapprochement which settled differences between both countries in East Asia and the Middle East only three years later. Though driven by the desire to diminish the increasingly heavier burden of imperial defense, these agreements also had the effect to contain Germany. However, this did not mean that the future was already foreordained. Despite alarmist reactions in Germany, the tribal alliance that went to war in 1914 still lay beyond the mental horizons of most statesmen. The great turning point of 1904 uh, helps to explain the emergence of the structures, however, within which a continental war in Europe became possible. But it cannot explain the specific reasons why that conflict arose. In order to explain this, it is necessary, may I have the next slide, uh, to refer to another dev development which increasingly began to have an important impact upon Germany as well as all other powers in Europe, the Balkan crisis. We have several Balkan crises. These crises caused by the desire of the Balkan states to become nation states like all the other states in Europe first resulted in driving out the Ottomans out of Europe in 1912. Whereas this in itself did not upset the balance of power, the fact that the Balkan, Balkan states, especially Serbia, now turned against the only other remaining power in Europe which had positions in the Balkans, Austria-Hungary, -Hungra, uh, was apt to set the spark on the powder barrel because any Austrian military reaction to that threat it was facing almost inevitably led to a conflict with Russia, the protector of all Slavs. Austria-Hungary was, however, the only reliable ally Germany had. Its collapse would have uh, severe repercussions on Germany's position in Europe. This meant that Germany in any crisis had no option but to support Austria even if this meant a European war. Realizing this as well as Germany's failure to achieve success in world policy, the nation's decision makers had decided in 1912 uh, to strengthen its position on the continent by increasing the German army twice within two years. This in turn caused an arms race on the continent with effects which were even more disastrous than the Anglo-German naval arms race. In spring 1914, Germany's decision makers faced a difficult international situation. On the one hand, relations with Great Britain seemed to improve. After many years of increasing tensions, the naval questions, question almost played no role anymore. Instead, though judgingly, the Secretary of the Imperial Navy Office again confirmed in Parliament that Germany accepted, accepted the existing ratio between the High Seas Fleet and the Royal Navy. As a sign of goodwill, in June 1914, a British squadron for the first time in ten years came to Germany to take part in Kiel Week. Moreover, Two agreements about minor colonial questions uh, were ready for signature. Astonishingly enough, even one of the hawks in the British Foreign Office, Arthur Nicholson, shared this opinion. Quote, since I have been at the Foreign Office, I have not seen such calm waters. <laughs> On the other hand, several events and developments seemed to indicate that Germany's security dilemma was increasing. France and Russia were obviously intensifying their efforts to strengthen their military position towards Germany. The new three-year law in France and Russian plans to improve its railway system in its western provinces uh, in order to accelerate um, the mobilization of its army should be mentioned here. Moreover, reports from a German spy in the Russian embassy in London nourished the feeling that the tribal entente was on the verge of becoming a real alignment, alliance aiming at containing Germany. Since Austria-Hungary was almost helplessly entangled in its domestic troubles, more and more decision makers came to the conclusion that Germany's future seemed bleak. An important member of this small number of decision makers, we have seen them at the beginning of my talk, in Germany was the chief of the general staff, Helmut von Molke. Since 1912 he had urged the government to launch a preventive war, but looking at the attempts of Germany's neighbor, neighbors to increase their armed forces, he stepped up his pressure upon the government to wage a preventive war as soon as possible. In his eyes, postponing a war would mean risking Germany's existence. Without any proof, he argued that in 1916, two years ahead, Germany's neighbors would be strong enough to attack Germany successfully and most probably would do so. Against this background, even Chancellor Bettmann Hollweg looked more gloomily into the future than ever before, asking his son, for example, whether it was re really worthwhile planting new trees on his estate near Berlin. The Russian steamroller, he argued, would soon destroy them anyway. Mm. Whereas Bettmann-Holweg has told his critics who urged for war in April to be more patient, 
for Germany would soon be able to buy the world instead of conquering it <laughs> military at a much higher cost and with uncertain results. He now also seemed willing to take war into account when he received the news of the assassination of the Austro-Hungarian heir to the throne. For Austria-Hungary, the murder of Francis Ferdinand once again confirmed the assumption that Serbia, which without any proof was at once blamed as the real culprit behind the assassination, was a serious danger to its existence, that accordingly this problem had to be solved at once and forever. Unlike in former years, the political and military leaders of the dual monarchy were unwilling to give in once again. For the, for the survival of the dual monarchy, as well as its prestige among the great powers, it seemed inevitably to teach Serbia a lesson. This meant nothing else but war. All decision makers were also willing to take the risk that this war might entail. We were also willing to take the risk that this war might entail a great European conflagration. In order to, to be successful, they seek the support of the German government. Subsequently, in early July, a special Austrian envoy traveled to Berlin, where he was given the so-called blank check by both the emperor and the chancellor. Why did, and here we come to the important points, why did the German government issue this blank check? First, against the background of Germany's deteriorating position in Europe, um, uh, this assassination seemed to offer an almost golden opportunity to turn the tide. In contrast to former crises, Germany was not involved directly. Instead, it only wanted to support an ally who rightly wanted to take revenge for the murder of its heir to the throne and once and for all give a response which was supposed to have a lasting effect. Second, a local war in the Balkans would not help, would not only help Austria to contain Serbia, Serb uh, irredentism, but also stop the latter's steady decline as a great power. This in return would have strengthened Germany's position as well, as well towards uh, the Entente. Third, a victorious local war would also help to reduce the influence of Russia as well as of France in, on Austria's doorstep. Fourth, Moreover, if Austria beat Serbia without the Russians coming to their support, Penslavism would also suffer a severe blow. Fifth, if Russia shied at intervening on Serbia's behalf for fear of fighting alone, this would be a diplomatic setback, which in turn might lead to a crisis of the Entente and thus help enlarge Germany's political freedom of movement. And sixth, if Russia, however, opted for war in order to support the Regicides in Belgrade, the German government was confident to win the Great War, which this decision would entail, even if Great Britain, whose position seemed unclear, would eventually enter uh, this war uh, on the side of its Entente partners. The last option was indeed a worst-case scenario. However, the German government was confident, or at least clung to the idea, that the Russian Tsar, uh, due to the latter's deep-rooted fear, deep fear of a revolution, would not support the assassins of a fellow monarch and thus allow Austria to take revenge. However, events soon proved that this notion was nothing but wishful thinking. First, if at all, this strategy was only feasible if Austria acted at once and declared war upon Serbia before the shock about the assassination had faded away and been replaced by sober political, power political considerations. And second, more importantly, why should the Entente powers, whose position in, in Europe towards the dual alliance in general as well as in the Balkans in particular had very much improved in the years before, allow Germany and Austria to exploit a local conflict to their advantage? Unfortunately, German decision makers never really calculated these risks. Instead, they tried to push the Austrians to con confront Belgrade with an ultimatum which the Serbian government could not accept. At the same time, the German government tried to appease the other powers, hoping to convince them that Austria was fighting a just cause. In the end, this did not work, for the members of the Entente were not willing to allow Austria to crush Serbia with German backing, and thus perhaps drive a wedge between the Entente powers. The fundamental dilemma of these developments was the fact that all decision makers at some point had to decide whether and when they would order mobilization in order uh, to back their political strategies with military force. Austria's decision uh, to reject Serbia's answer to the ultimatum and to, uh, to attack Serbia caused Russia to order partial soon general mobilization. This in turn prompted the German government, may I have the next slide? Yeah, you have the emperor, this is a famous postcard. Uh, which uh, contains 
um, parts of his speech he gave from the balcony of his uh, imperial castle in Berlin, and in which he said, as an act of self-defense with a clear conscience and a clear hand, we resort to our sword. This was the, the most popular speech he ever gave. <laughs> <laughs> This in turn prompted the German government to mobilize its army and its navy as well. And uh, this, at least in some circles, this was popular. May I have the next slide? There you have, uh, uh, after the, the, the mobilization order had uh, been issued and made public, uh, you have young people uh, volunteering um, for war. More importantly, in order to, f to, to fully exploit the advantages of its military strength, the German government declared war upon France and Russia. At the same time, it sent an ultimatum to the Belgian government demanding free passage through its territory. The famous Schlieffen Plan, may I have the next slide? Oh, this is Europe morning, sorry. May I have the next slide? Here you have the famous Schlieffen Plan, this attempt uh, to uh, sweep through, through Belgium and the north of France and uh, encircle the, the, the French armies. Uh, carefully developed in the decade before, left no option. Only a quick uh, victory against France before the Russian steamroller had begun its move against Germany's eastern provinces seemed to promise success. The fact that the violation of Belgian neutrality would inevitably uh, draw Britain into the war as one of the guarantees of Belgian uh, uh, neutrality was never fully th uh, thoroughly calculated. Moltke used to argue that the Prussian police would be sufficient to arrest Britain's 100,000 man army. <laughs> The Chancellor hoped that Britain would uh, stay out of the war at least long enough until important decisions on the battlefield had fallen. Sooner than expected, all hopes connected with the decision to unleash a European war proved wrong. Before coming to a conclusion, please allow me to throw some light on the developments which followed. Whereas many people, especially from the bourgeois classes, cheered when war was declared and rallied behind the Kaiser and his men, Europe soon had every reason to mourn. Uh, this was the slide you have seen before, it was, by the way, a French uh, postcard, uh, and uh, w which this uh, Swiss postcard um, suggested at the end of the year. First, the Schlieffen plan we have seen here, developed to crush France in a sweeping maneuver through Belgium, proved a complete failure. Second, moreover, step by step, the whole continent, and may I have the next two slides, Oh, yeah. Here you, you have uh, the France in 19, uh, between 1915 and 16. You, you can see how the, the war really mm, uh, took part in many parts of Europe. And if you look at 17 and 16, I have the next one. The next. Oh, the one before. You can see how much of the, the East was uh, conquered by the Germans. And you also have the Ottoman Empire here. So. Huge parts of Europe were completely destroyed. The third, huge parts of Europe, and this is the next slide, were completely destroyed. In France and Belgium, you have uh, Louvain in Belgium, 1914, deliberately destroyed by German armies uh, in retaliation of so-called front tireur attacks. Roughly 1,500 towns and villages simply vanished in the fire of heavy artillery. Uh, this also happened, of course, in, in East Prussia. May I have the next one? Uh, these are destructions caused by the Russians. Uh, fifth, w uh, fourth, with the Battle of the Marne, may I have the next slide? Yeah, you have French troops here. Mm -hmm. With the Battle of the Marne, the war of movement ended and was replaced by trench warfare whose aim was attrition. May I have the next one? Uh, this is trench warfare. And fifth, this war of attrition, may I have the next one? Here you have the German attack on Verdun. This is Fort Wilmot in 1916. New weapons, the next one, the machine gun played a, uh, a very increasingly more important role during the war. Uh, and may I have the next one? You have the war in the air. And the next one, you have gas uh, used by the Germans for the first time. This is the German gas attack at Ypres in 1915. The next one, uh, you have tanks as one of the new weapons and which the Germans, Germans really never knew, uh, estim whose value was never fully estimated by the Germans. And next, of course, you have uh, the high seas fleet, which plays no role, and then the turn to submarine warfare, which eventually lures the Am Americans in. Uh, the next one, this is propaganda for the submarine warfare. And since the failure of classical warfare on the high seas, you have submarine warfare. And six, fighting such an, may I have the next slide? 
Uh, this is German airplanes over the pyramids. <laughs> they wanted to conquer the, 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 the Suez Canal, but it didn't work. But nevertheless, they took this. May I say so? Nice picture. Um, <laughs> the next one. Uh, fighting such a war in an era of imperialism, nationalism and capitalism also encouraged many people to formulate incredible war aims. Uh, here you can see a German soldier jumping over the channel uh, to London and uh, conquering Britain. Well, this was one of the, 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 the dreams some of them had. And by achieving them, they hoped to improve the position, position of one's own power in the world in every respect. And seventh, powers which proved unable to be successful, however, soon faced serious domestic problems. In this respect, the First World War gave rise to a number of revolutionary movements. I have the next slide. Here you have Russia. Uh, by the way, taken over by the chief of military intelligence, to, the German military intelligence to Russia, which is one of the ironies of history. And um, uh, in this respect, the First World, War, First World War gave rise to a number of revolutionary movements which soon swept away old monarchies and established new political and economic systems, which, as well, we all know, disastrous consequences for the later course of the 20th century. And uh, may I have the next one? And this is the revolution in Berlin in 1918. And eight, However, not only revolutionary movements had a deep impact upon the later course of the 20th century, this also applies to the failure of the victors to conclude a peace which uh, uh, those they had defeated could have respected. May I have the next one? So you remember, was, the Germans had to sign it in the same Hall of Mirrors where the, the, the German Empire had been founded in 1871. And you can see here the Allies and the Germans sitting in uh, you know, the very poor chair in front of them. And no choice of uh, debating or discussing uh, what the terms were. Um, unfortunately, this proved impossible after a war which had been fought mercilessly, in, in which more than 10 million soldiers had lost their lives and many more had been wounded, in which huge landscapes were de devastated, in which millions of civilians had lost their homes or had become victims, and in which whole economies had uh, begun to face bankruptcy. Conclusion. In my opinion, there can be no doubt that Austria and Germany have to bear the greater share regarding the responsibility for the outbreak of the war. They were determined to launch a local war in the Balkans, fully aware of the fact that this might also cause a great European, if not even a world war. Second, when they decided upon this policy of political brinkmanship, they had, of course, only a vague idea of what kind of war they were risking. In the event, instead of being an almost surgical strike, the war turned out to be an almost total war, which soon included all societies in which was fought in many parts of the world. Third, they also had no idea of the consequences this war might have. It destroyed three empires, the Ottoman, the Russian and the Austrian empires, without establishing a new stable order. It threw many parts of Europe into decades of revolutionary turmoil and civil war, thus supporting the rise of fascism, not only among the losers, but also the victors of war. Italy is the best example. It destroyed flourishing economies, which took years and American money in the 1920s to recover slowly. It destroyed the confidence, and this is also very important in my mm. opinion, among European politicians and many, uh, many others for decades. Most importantly, it dis destroyed the lives of millions directly or indirectly. The almost complete manhood, aged between 20 and 40 years, had uh, been wiped out in many countries. It took those who survived and their families years to overcome these experiences. Unfortunately, at least in Germany, too few were willing to learn from it. Instead, they thought that the new war, we may have the last slide, this is revenge. Here you have this originally proud Germania, you can see uh, the crown and her sword uh, lying here, uh, standing at the torture pole. Uh, here are the Allies as vultures. But there is a shining and that means we will take revenge one day. This is a fam popular postcard in Germany in the 1920s. Uh, unfortunately, at least in Germany, too few were willing to learn from it. Instead, they thought that a new war remedying the results of one lost before might open up a bright future. This conviction proved to have even more disastrous results than the one they had just lost. But this is another story. Thank you very much.
you, you described how in 1914 the politicians and the generals who made the decision to fight had only a vague idea of the kind of war it would actually become. But by 1915, 1916, on both sides, all could see what a terrible war it was, what a miscalculation it was. How do you explain the, uh, the lack of interest on both sides in the effort that Woodrow Wilson and his Colonel House tried to make in those years before the U.S. got into the war to find some kind of political compromise solution? Well, for many, for both sides, for the German as well as for the Allies, compromise, a compromise peace uh, would have resembled defeat. Because after uh, these enormous sacrifices regarding manpower, uh, destruction, money and whatsoever, uh, it seemed completely out of the questions to say, well, it was a mistake and uh, we could go home. And that's why everybody thought, whether on the side of the Allies as well uh, uh, in, in Germany, thought that he had to gain something. And uh, this was the problem, especially uh, the Germans had financed the war by uh, borrowing money. Uh, and they borrowed money because they said, well, those we defeat are going to pay for this. And this would have had di disastr disastrous consequences upon, uh, the, on, upon German domestic politics. And the same would have been probably the case with the, with the Allies. That, that made it impossible. Sir, again, thank you very much. So thank you very much. How would you characterize the deterioration of uh, relations between Germany and Russia? Because there were opportunities in the past where they could have allied, but what really drove their suspicions that they were going to be about two years from being attacked by Russia? Well, it was, um, first of all, the, the, the enormous increase of the Russian army and the, the recovery of the Russian army had uh, happened much more quickly than the Germans had anticipated after this uh, severe defeat in 1905-1906. And, uh, so and, and on the other hand, the Germans knew that the French were also rearming and um, the, the Austrians and the following the Germans as well, they had been got entangled in these Balkan politics. And uh, so the military said, okay, this is a situation which resembles very much to the situation in 1756. Uh, when uh, Prussia had been uh, surrounded or encircled, as one would later say, had been surrounded also by Russia, France, and in this case, even Austria. And when only the British had come to their aid. So this was something they had in their mind. So they said, preemptive strikes have a long tradition in Germany. So, and we, the military, know how to do this, and we can make it. And that's eventually the scenario they pre presented to the politicians. And the politicians decided, well, the preventive war is only the last case, uh, the worst case scenario. Let's try uh, this uh, policy of political brinkmanship as some kind of um, compromise between preventive war and um, staying aside. And we will test them. And this went wrong. Question over here. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, it was wonderful. Um, I'd be remiss as an American not to ask a question about ourselves. And so, um, in a larger picture, I'd be interested in your perspective about uh, America's role, because we've always went from isolationism to being very aggressive. And the, the fact, and we still have this today, about the role of whether we should, as a, as a power, come in or not, and when, and this, of your perspective of America's decision to wait until we had to, and we did in the Second War II, and there was always some catalyst to get in. Uh, I won't say culpability for America, but what would have been, in your opinion, uh, was there a desire or should have been uh, a chance for us to enter the war earlier? Would there have been a greater impact than that? And, and I guess in a sense from larger about America's position in the world, I know that's kind of a larger question, but uh, about Am I framing that well? I, I know what you mean. Well, it's, 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 it's guesswork somewhat. But if the Americans had entered into to the war after the Lusitania crisis, uh, this might have had a certain impact. But the, the question is, would this have been possible here in America? Would it have been possible for President Wilson to say, we go into war? This is a difficult question. 
And uh, did the Americans really have an interest at that time to enter into the war? I, I don't see it, but the Germans began to be uh, n to get nervous about a, a possible American entry, but they never thought uh, about the, the, the potential the Americans had. And the, the, the military, who didn't know very much about the Americans, especially who regarded the American army, small as it was anyway, as, well, sure. as a joke. <laughs> That was a joke. They said, and, and moreover, they said, they are so far away until they start mobilizing uh, all their resources, military, economic, and what, whatsoever, we will have won. That's what they said to the politicians. And if you look at the decision of um, beginning with the unrestricted uh, submarine warfare in early 1917, why did they do this? First, the military said, well, we have just won the war against Romania conquered by us. Second, the army promised no American troopship will be able to cross the Atlantic Ocean without being sunk. And even, uh, they said, even before the Americans can start mobilizing their troops and putting them into troopships to go over, we will have forced the British onto their knees with our submarines. And uh, that was it. And even in, at the end of 1917, early 1918, Ludendorff, when he began to prepare uh, his last offensive, he, he said, well, where are these few Americans? What are they doing on the Western Front? Nothing. And um, so he said, just one onslaught against the Allies and it will all be over. So th they, f they, they fully underestimated uh, the American potential. And uh, well, just one last remark, uh, Germany, when they started the offensive in 1918, uh, they had just 300,000 men to mobilize. This was uh, their last reserve. When the Americans came into Europe, they sent in 300,000 men a month, replacing the losses of, of their allies. And this was something they had never calculated. And uh, what this is probably typical for all Europeans. They knew nothing about the Americans. And if you also think of the fact that the German Navy planned uh, to attack the United States. They made war plans against the United States after the, 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 this uh, wind in the Bay of Manila. And they r were really convinced that they could land forces here at Hampton Roads uh, and at uh, um, the Hudson in New York and beat the American army and force America uh, to, German sub uh, to be sub uh, subservient uh, to, the, to, to Germany. It's incredible, but that's what they did. Bill, did you have a question? We'll yeah. let, this have to let this be the last one, I think. Thank you again, uh, Professor Eppinghaus. Uh, but um, I, I confess I didn't see much light between uh, uh, Christopher Clark's uh, thesis on the sleepwalkers and your own. Uh, uh, perhaps it's only a matter of emphasis. And, um, and along with um, the Treaty of Versailles, which specifically blamed Germany and, and the, mm. the Habsburgs, but uh, uh, and most of the European politicians in the 20s and 30s recognized uh, what that had led to, and uh, and 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 basically admitted the the, the British did uh, at least uh, that they were almost as culpable, not quite as uh, they, they didn't come out and confess it, but uh, there was contrition about the Versailles Treaty, which specifically blames Germany. And uh, so I, I just didn't see much light between you and Chris Clark, having read The Sleepwalkers. Thank you. Well, I c can only say, uh, if you look at me and Chris Clark, the, the main difference is that it was the Germans and the Austrians who decided to escalate this event, this assassination. And that's why they have to main part of the responsibility. This is what I would always argue. And if you look at the fact, this is something Chris Clark also ignores, on the 19th July, before the ultimatum, the Russian foreign minister told the German uh, ambassador in St. Petersburg, Russia, Russia is um, peaceful, but it's not passive. Hmm. So this, is, this was a clear message, what would happen. And the Germans ignored it. Because they thought uh, the greater the humiliation of the, the, the Entente powers, uh, the greater their own political success 
Well, that was the problem. And uh, this, uh, this is something Chris Clark, in my opinion, ignores. By putting more blame upon the Allies, uh, in, in, in this was even before the French president arrived in St. Petersburg. Mm. Okay, I think that's going to have to do it for the questions. Uh, we we'll bring in uh, Dr. Dave Hogan. He's going to be our CMH uh, senior representative today. Our director, unfortunately, is in Kansas City uh, this week. We have a few uh, small tokens of appreciation that uh, Dr. Hogan will present. If you didn't get enough history today, there will also be a uh, panel discussion tomorrow at the Woodrow Wilson House from about 5.30 to 7.30. Dr. Hepkin Hans and two other panelists uh, from American universities will present also on uh, the origins of World War One. So that should be an interesting topic as well. As you know, uh, you can go to the Woodrow Wilson uh, House website and look up the details. I think there's a small charge for that event. But we want to thank Dr. Hepkin Hans for coming all the way from uh, Potsdam, Germany. We appreciate his insights uh, from the other side of the pond and uh, it's a key year, I think, obviously, a uh, hundred years later, but we also look uh, to live today and we see what's happening today. And, and we look at the politicians a hundred years ago and we thought, uh, you know, well, those guys were really smart there. They would never do anything that crazy, right? Mm -hmm. So we all, all think sometimes we can stand to the edge of the cliff uh, and then step back at the right moment, but sometimes we jump over the cliff. And 1914 was that year and uh, the world has never been quite the same. But Dr. Hogan? Thanks, Phil. Just would like to thank you uh, for joining us, Professor Epkenhaus. Thank you very much. Thank you. Present you a copy of our Portrait of an Army. Oh, thank series you very of much. artworks from, army, from our Army Art Collection. Take back to Germany with you. Thank you very much. And also the campaigns of World War II, the war against Germany, which is... <laughs> 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 I must admit, this was a very good choice because, well, it was a very good choice because uh, the, the um, as I said before, it was again asked to, to, to launch this war, so mm -hmm. it was. <laughs> well, at a time when we're very focused here on the 150th anniversary of the Civil War, it's helpful for somebody to come across Europe and remind us of a conflict that has had enormous impact, certainly on our, our present, but uh, also very much on Europe's as well and on the world. So, um, and, and for a distinguished scholar with all your work, I know, in German navalism over the years, it's great to have you here with us. Thank, thank you very, you very thank much. You thank you. Thank you for coming. I hope you attend future OSD History Speaker Series. Thank you so much.